Recently, I was sent the B-Link SEI-12 with the Core i7-12650H processor with 32 gigs of memory. How does this little mini PC perform as a home lab server? What is its home server potential, especially running hypervisors such as VMware ESXi or Proxmox? Well, stick around. We're going to deep dive into this little mini PC and see what its true potential is as a home server. Mini PCs are a great way to have a home lab environment that is efficient, quiet, and yet still powerful enough to run home services that we all want to run in our home lab environment. The B-Link SEI-12 is no exception to that. It is a powerful little mini PC, and it sports the Core i7-12650H processor. Now, I had some reservations about the specs for this mini PC since the Core i7-12650H is a consumer grade processor that has the performance and efficiency core architecture. So you will see that when you look at the specs for the, the 12650H, seeing those performance cores and efficiency cores. In fact, it has six performance cores and 10 efficiency cores. The six performance cores will actually hyperthread. So in a sense, you have 12 logical processors with those performance cores. The efficiency cores have no hyperthreading. So they are what they are. So we've got four efficiency cores. The SEI-12 that B-Link sent to me to evaluate was configured with the 32 gig configuration of DDR4 memory. And it also has a 500 gig NVMe drive pre-installed with Windows 11 Pro. If you want to just simply buy the machine for workstation purposes, for some light virtualization, running something like VMware Workstation or Hyper-V, you certainly could do that and it would serve that use case well. However, those of you that have watched the channel know that with the mini PCs for home server configuration that we review here, I like to load type one hypervisors. So we're talking VMware ESXi, Proxmox, XCPNG, a little bit of Hyper-V. And obviously this is far outside the scope of what the use case was designed for this mini PC. However, with mini PCs becoming so popular in the home lab community, these configurations can certainly be looked at to run those enterprise hypervisors. Now, going back to the processor configured with the SEI-12, it is configured with the 12th generation Alder Lake Core i7-12650H. Again, that's 10 cores, 16 threads. Again, the six performance cores, four efficiency cores. It bursts up to 4.7 gigahertz. It has 24 megs of smart cache built in. It sports UHD graphics with a 1.4 gigahertz max dynamic frequency for the graphics processor, 32 gigs of DDR4, 3200 megahertz memory, and the maximum configuration there with DDR4 is 64 gigs of memory. It has two slots, so you can run those memory modules in dual channel. It has one M2 2280 NVMe slot, and also, which is nice to see in this form factor, it also sports a two and a half inch SSD drive bay. So you can, in addition, to that NVMe drive, you can certainly uh, retrofit this with a two and a half inch SSD, which is great for hypervisors because you can essentially have uh, like a fast storage tier as well as a little bit slower SSD storage. And certainly if you wanna think about hyperconverged infrastructure labs, such as VMware vSAN or Proxmox with Ceph, drive configuration from a hardware perspective certainly lends itself to running those types of uh, configurations in the home lab. One of the downsides with this B-Link SEI-12 is it's configured with a one gig network adapter that is also Realtek based. And many of the B-Link units I've noticed are definitely on the side of Realtek networking. And 
not just picking on VLink there, there are a lot of the many PC manufacturers that utilize the Realtek adapters in their hardware configurations. For Proxmox and other Linux-based hypervisors, that's not an issue. However, many of you know that VMware ESXi will not support Realtek network adapters from a physical LAN adapter perspective. So definitely keep that in mind with this unit. It's not really VMware friendly. So let's take a look at the Proxmox dashboard and see how many VMs I was able to get running in a reasonable manner, as well as some other details that we see inside of Proxmox. So I'm logged into the Proxmox instance that I have running on this B-Link SEI 12 mini PC with the Core i7-12650H processor. And I'm going to click on the summary screen just to show you guys. I don't have any workloads running at the moment. And as you can see, we've got 12 CPUs listed. And that is because in this case, I do have the efficiency cores disabled on the SEI 12. And that is so that I can have everything consistent. All of the cores are identical. All the workloads are going to perform uh, exactly the same. And I'll show you guys how you can enable those as well as uh, a couple other interesting things that we can do and take a look at in Proxmox. But I wanted to show you guys, I'm going to do a bulk start of all the virtual machines. You can see that I was able to get around 30 virtual machines and each of these are configured with one and a half gigs of memory, two virtual CPUs. So that is the hardware configuration. Pretty impressive, I think, that with 32 gigs of memory, we can get 30 virtual machines running Ubuntu Server 2204 LTS. So let me do the uh, bulk startup, and I'll show you guys how quickly it'll chew through startup and powering on of 30 virtual machines. We can actually go through and power on some of these manually as it is powering on via the automated process. What I did do when I was testing the power draw on the SEI 12 is I did exactly what I'm doing here. I kicked off the startup bulk startup operation, and then I went through and just quickly powered on additional virtual machines just to push that CPU workload up as high as possible. And as you can see, though, this little machine is actually chewing through that work very, very well. It was actually a bit challenging to max out the CPU and keep it there for long enough to really see the power draw of the unit. I was able to do that, but you can see even manually powering on additional virtual machines, it is actually doing a very nice job of satisfying that demand quickly and then ramp the CPUs back down. So 30 virtual machines, as you guys just saw, and already we have returned to basically an idle condition. I have been very impressed with this CPU, even with those four efficiency cores disabled, but even without the help of those four efficiency cores, those 12 cores really worked through the work of powering on these virtual machines and getting those essentially to an idle state, even with that boot process of multiple VMs at the same time. I wanted to show you guys the BIOS option to control the P cores versus the efficiency cores. And that is found in the BIOS under the advanced settings. So you go to the advanced menu, CPU configuration, and then we scroll down and you will see the active performance cores and active efficient cores. As you see here, to effectively disable the efficient cores, I have this set to zero. So if we drill into the menu, we can flag this to all. If we want all of the efficient cores to be enabled along with the performance cores, or you can actually enable a certain number of those. So I'm going to show you guys in Proxmox some interesting information that we can take a look at from a CPU perspective and how we can pin virtual machines to specific cores and set that affinity. So I want to show you guys, I am now SSH into the Proxmox VE server in the home lab. And this is after we have went into the BIOS and re-enabled the efficient cores. And I want to show you guys now in the dashboard, if we look at the summary screen, we're going to see that we've got 16 CPU. So if you remember before, we had the 12, which is the six performance cores with hyper threading. So there are the 12 cores. Then the four efficient cores have no hyper threading. So it's just the four cores 
plus the 12 cores from the performance cores. One of the interesting things that we can do is run the lscpu-e command. When we enter that command, we can see some interesting information in terms of which CPUs and which identifiers for those CPUs that we have enabled. Now, interestingly, you can see that the zeros are doubled for the CPU core. We've got two ones, we've got two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives. And then when you'll notice when we see the six, seven, eight, and nine, we see that there are not two of those numbers listed. Now, what those are, are the efficient cores. And you can tell those, if you look specifically at the max megahertz, we know they don't scale as high in megahertz as the performance cores. So we can see 3,500 megahertz as opposed to our performance cores here. Now, what's interesting is we can actually use this information when we configure virtual machines so that if you want to enable the efficient cores, make use of those cores with specific virtual machines, maybe that you don't care if they run a little bit slower than the ones that are pinned to the performance cores. We can go into the settings for the virtual machine. We can go to hardware, we can go to processors, and then we can check the advanced option. And if you notice when you check the advanced option, there is a lot more information that we can make use of. What's interesting to us is this CPU affinity. If we want to pin those virtual machines or particular virtual machines to a specific efficient core, then we can do that. Or the exact opposite, if we don't want a virtual machine to ever go on to an efficient core, we can always pin that particular virtual machine to a performance core. In my opinion, this is still a bit of a downside with the performance and efficient cores in a modern hypervisor because there isn't a box that we can check off in Proxbox and say, hey, I want you to group these particular virtual machines and I only want those to run on a performance core or I want these to run on efficient cores. There's not that type of automation built within the hypervisor. So that's something that you will have to take care of manually when you are looking to pin those virtual machines to specific CPU cores. From a power consumption perspective, on boot, I saw the SEI 12 hit around 20 watts of power draw. Now, as I stair-step the virtual machines up running on the SEI 12, when I powered down all 30 of the virtual machines, powered them on at the same time, just to see if I could max out the CPUs, which I was able to do, and catch the power draw at roughly 99, 100%, I saw around 94 watts coming from the mini PC. So keep that in mind. That's probably the range of power draw that you're going to see with this configuration, anywhere from 20 to uh, 94 watts of power. However, one thing I will mention, those 30 virtual machines, as they settle down and as they are idle, I saw around 25 watts, which is very respectable. My super micro servers are drawing around 100 watts. Now, granted, they have two 10 gig adapters and two 1 gig adapters, some add-in cards and a few other things. However, as we all know, many PCs, especially with the newer processor architectures and other advantages that they have, are definitely more power efficient. So I want to give you guys a physical overview of this B-Link SEI 12 with the Core i7. So classic B-Link styling with this mini PC, uh, very well made. It feels like it's very, very sturdy. It, it, it has that heft to it of quality, as you would expect. Uh, I do believe it is some metal along with plastic. I may be wrong on that. Um, also, it has an interesting feel on the front. It, it's almost like it's very cloth-like, uh, almost a soft feel to the touch. On the front of the unit, you have just the minimal I.O. You've got the power button. You've got two uh, USB-A ports. You've got the USB-C port. You've also got a headphone jack that I don't know if you guys can see right by the uh, power button there. There is no I.O. on the side, which I really like and is fairly common in this form factor. 
Uh, but I like not having cables coming out of every side. It makes it a lot easier to route things. Also on the back, B-Link has a really nice exhaust in the back of the unit. So hot air can be exhausted here. And also you've got the barrel connector for the power adapter. You've got a display port and an HDMI port located on the back. You've got two more USB-A connections. And then you've also got the one gig LAN adapter port. Now to access the memory as well as the NVMe drive, you take the four screws out of the bottom plate. And I like how they thought ahead. They've got a little pull tab here, as I've seen on the other B-Links that I have reviewed. And that just pops right off. Underneath the cover is a fan shroud, as well as the plastic housing that you can insert the two and a half inch SSD. So you have, I think it's five more screws to take off after you had the bottom cover off and you take those screws out, take the fan shroud out, and then you have access to the two dim slots as well as the M2 slot. Very easy to upgrade, really minimal disassembly required just to get to those components. So I really like that about this unit. So guys, what did you think about the B-Link SEI 12? I think it's a powerful little mini PC with some quirks and downsides, as I mentioned. Uh, one of those being the Realtek one gig network adapter. Uh, you're gonna have problems with VMware if you don't use a USB network adapter. And then also the performance versus efficiency course. That is a configuration that is simply not really handled well by modern hypervisors. And the most stable option is simply disabling those efficiency cores just to make sure there's no quirkiness. Well, I'm Brandon Lee. I hope you guys have enjoyed this hardware overview of the B-Link SEI 12 with the Core i7-12650H processor. Please do like this video, subscribe to the channel. Hope you guys are staying safe out there, keep home labbing, and I will see you guys on the next video.